We come now to God's Word this morning. We'll be in the book of Joel this morning. We'll be reading selections from the book of Joel. And rather than read the entire book, or, in, or at least two whole chapters together, we're going to be reading through it as we go through the sermon. So we'll read selections of the book of Joel this morning. So I invite you to turn with me in your pew Bible and your copy of God's Word to the book of Joel. And we'll be reading selections from chapter 1 and chapter 2 this morning. Before we turn to God's Word, let's pray together and ask for His help. Our Father, we come before you this day needful. Needful of your grace. Needful of your forgiveness. Needful of your Holy Spirit. Father, we often deceive ourselves. We think that we are holier than we are. We think, Lord, that we're doing better than we actually are. Lord, we hide our sin from one another, from ourselves, and even from you, Lord. So we pray that this morning, through your word and by your spirit, that you would expose us before your word. That we would see ourselves as we are. That you would graciously warn us about the dangers of sin and call us back to, to life in you, in Christ, and by the power of your spirit. Lord, would you speak this morning? For your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. It didn't have to end this way. It could have been avoided. Those are some of the most uh, gut-wrenching words that you could speak or hear on the other side of tragedy. To know that something could have been done to avoid the disaster, to avoid the grief, to avoid the pain. It's almost unthinkable. Next month will mark 112 years since the sinking of the RMS Titanic in the early morning hours of April the 15th, 1912. 1,500 people lost their lives when that ship went down. It was one of the greatest maritime disasters in history. But as has been recounted over and over again over the past century or so by multiple individuals, it didn't have to end that way. It could have been avoided. First of all, the ship could have been constructed more carefully. The shipwrights that made the Titanic didn't think it was necessary to spend extra money on a full double hull or on fully sealed, watertight bulkheads. They thought and they advertised that a, a modern ship like this of such grandeur was practically unsinkable. But most tragic were the Warnings that the Titanic received on the early morning hours and the late evening hours and the early morning of April 15th of the dangerous ice field that lay ahead. Warnings that, for the most part, went unheeded. Several different ships radioed the Titanic that night and warned her about the large ice field that she was entering. And even though Captain Smith received and acknowledged these warnings, the ship continued forward at full speed, heading straight into the dangerous waters. In fact, the nearest ship to the Titanic at that time, the SS California, had decided that the ice field was too dangerous to cross. They had stopped their voyage for the night. A radio operator from the Californian actually radioed the Titanic to inform them of the fact that they had stopped for the night, again, warning them of the danger that lay ahead. But senior wireless operator Jack Phillips was too busy relaying incoming messages for passengers to pay attention to that last final warning from the Californian. At one point, he became so frustrated and angry at all the different incoming messages that he responded to the warning of the Californian with, Shut up. Shut up. And that was less than 10 minutes before the Titanic hit that fateful iceberg and 1,500 people lost their lives. 
It didn't have to end that way. It could have been avoided. Now, as tragic as that is, the reality that we find in the book of Joel this morning, this morning is, is infinitely worse. Because what we find in the book of Joel this morning is a people headed towards disaster. The people of Israel, the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. But this was not just a temporal disaster. This was not just a, a disaster at a specific point in time. This was an eternal disaster, eternal ruin that, that comes with the outpouring of God's divine justice towards them in their sin. And they are not heeding the warning. They're stopping up their ears, careening full speed towards destruction, thinking that perhaps their nation was unsinkable. And we would do well to pay attention as the people of God because what we learn from this passage is, that, is the danger of ignoring the warning signs of spiritual unhealth. The danger of ignoring the warning signs of spiritual ruin. As we come to the close of this season of solemn assembly as a, as a church family, our goal has been to expose those warning signs in all of us. Those warning signs of spiritual unhealth to, to heed those warning signs and, and turn around before it's too late. Our goal has been to humble ourselves before the Lord, to humble ourselves before his law so that he would show us our sins, show us our rebellion, and then call us back to the path of life, to the path of life in Christ. And so as we meditate on this portion of God's word this morning, we'll find together first a, a cry of warning. Second, we'll find a, cry, a call to repentance and finally, a promise of salvation. So first we find a cry of warning. That's what the book of Joel begins with in chapter 1. It says, hear this, you elders. Give ear all the inhabitants of the land. This warning comes to the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, most likely in the middle of the 8th century B.C., comes in the midst of a great plague, a great plague of locusts. And as we'll see, the locusts themselves are a, a word of warning to the people of Israel. As the prophet continues in verses 2 through 4, he says, has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. That's a description of complete destruction. See, the word of the Lord comes to this people of Israel telling them that this plague was no accident. It was not just a force of nature. It was the gracious warning of Almighty God to them in their sin. Yes, the locust had devoured their crops, their fields, their vineyards. They'd left in their wake a great famine. But this was nothing compared to the great spiritual famine in which these people found themselves. The plague of locusts was God's gracious warning about the spiritual danger that they were in. You see, the people faced moral and spiritual decline. They were being ruled by unjust and unrighteous kings who were leading their people into sin. They were beginning to turn aside to other gods. Their, their religion had turned into nothing but a show, a performance. They were careening full speed towards spiritual disaster. And God is calling them by His grace to pay attention. Going as far as in verse 5 to say, Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, you drinkers of wine. See, the people of Israel were not, were not paying attention to this 
danger that they were in, the danger of spiritual decline. God compares them here to a drunkard. Like a a drunkard, they were trapped in, in, in a drunken stupor, stumbling around, ignorant, half asleep. And to them, this gracious, loving warning in the Word of God comes to them, telling them to wake up. Wake up. Don't you see what is happening? Don't you see what's happened to your crops? Don't you see that the worship in the temple has ceased? How my offerings are withheld? Don't you see the danger that you're in? Sound the alarm. So it says at the beginning of chapter 2, sound an alarm, blow a trumpet. This is serious. See, beloved, the Lord in his providence, by his grace, will bring us into circumstances in our lives that are meant to wake us up, that are meant to be a warning to us, that are meant to draw us back to him. The question is whether or not we will pay attention to those warning signs. Certainly that's true for individuals. There are warning signs for spiritual unhealth. It's when we continually fall into sin and temptation and we gave up fighting. Gave up fighting long ago. That's a warning sign. When we find ourselves hopelessly trapped by addiction, that's a warning sign. When we find ourselves trapped in unforgiveness, enmity, bitterness, even with our brothers and sisters in Christ, even with our own family, that's a warning sign of spiritual unhealth. When our hearts grow cold towards God and our worship becomes a a tired charade when we grow lukewarm. That's a warning sign. When we look at God's law and we see how far short we fall of his standard and we begin to think, yeah, what's the big deal? We're all sinners. Holiness doesn't really matter. That's a warning sign of spiritual unhealth. And the question is, what do we do with these warning signs? Do we even notice them? Or do we cover our ears? Are we trying to live the the, the Christian life asleep at the wheel, careening towards disaster? Here's why this matters today, beloved It's because one of the signs of genuine faith in Christ, that you actually belong to Christ, that you're one of his children, that you're actually born again, is that you are living a life of repentance. Not a perfect life, not a sinless life, but a life of repentance. That when you hear your father's voice warning you, When you hear your father's voice calling you back graciously, back to him, calling you away from your sin, away from that dangerous path, when you hear your father's voice, you listen. You hear him. And you run to him. Because here's the danger. There are so many people who call themselves Christians who call themselves God's people that are living a lie, that are deceiving themselves and are heading full speed towards disaster, never paying attention to the warning signs, hearing sermon after sermon after sermon, and those sermons are always about somebody else. Never heeding the warning signs that they're on the path towards spiritual danger, perhaps even that they're lost. They say to themselves, it doesn't really matter if I repent of my sins. I'm basically a good person. I go to church. It doesn't matter if I understand the gospel or not. I can just believe something 
vague about how God loves me and he has a plan for my life. It doesn't really matter that at a practical level my so-called Christian faith makes no impact in my heart or life. I'm no different than the world in which I live. I'm sure that at the end of the day, God would, he would never send a good religious person, a good upstanding citizen like me, to hell. And what's true for individuals is true for churches as well. Churches can ignore warning signs. It's easy for us to ignore the warning signs of spiritual unhealth in the church. That's why there are so many churches across, across our nation that year after year are declining and declining and declining and then eventually they close. In America, about 4,500 churches close every year. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be avoided. And that reality holds true even for our church, even for New Covenant. As our church membership declined over 10 years from 270 down to 130, as our attendance declined over that same time from 120 down to 50, as our Bible studies Sunday school, prayer meeting, shriveled up? Did we see that as a wake-up call? Did we see that as the, as the gracious warning of Almighty God of our spiritual health? Or did we try to blame it on something else. Saying we just didn't have the right pastor. We just didn't have the right music. We just didn't have nice enough looking facilities. We didn't have good enough strategies. We just had a hard time making it through COVID. Ignoring those warning signs that perhaps, just perhaps the problem isn't the pastor or the music or the strategies or the facilities that maybe, just maybe, the problem is us. Our spiritual decline, our spiritual unhealth that's led to spiritual decline in our church toward an inward focus and an ineffectiveness in our ministries. You see, beloved, this is the reason why we are in a process of revitalization as a church family. This is why we are in a season of solemn assembly. Because we do not believe what we've experienced over the past 10 to 15 years is an accident. We don't believe it is someone else or something else's fault. We believe that it is God's gracious warning to us, sounding the alarm to wake us up, calling us away from that dangerous path and back to life in Him. Because not only do we see a cry of warning in this passage that we're supposed to hear and heed, we see a call to repentance. What are we supposed to do with those warning signs? We see a call to repentance in verse 14 where it says consecrate a fast. Call a, a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. How are we supposed to respond when we're confronted with the reality of our spiritual and health and decline? How are we supposed to respond to God's gracious warning? Not by minimizing our sin. Not by shifting the blame. Not trying to point to someone else and something else. Not trying to hide. We are to respond by gathering together as the people of God in order to cry out to him in repentance. Repentance. 
That is what we come to do today. We've gathered in the Lord's house on the Lord's day as the Lord's people to cry out to him together, to humble ourselves before him, saying we don't want to ignore the warning signs anymore. We don't want to pretend. We don't want to cover over our sins. We need your forgiveness and grace. Lord, help us. And here's the promise for us. When we come in faith, in repentance, there's a beautiful promise in this passage. When we soften our hearts before God and admit our need, here's the promise out of chapter 2, verse 12. It says, yet even now. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your hearts. Oh, what wonderful grace this is. Grace for us today. What beautiful words of, of invitation these are to us. Yet even now, there's still time. No matter how far you've fallen, no, no matter how much of a hypocrite you've been, no matter what kind of sin you've been hiding in your heart, no matter how cold your heart has grown, no matter how many times you've ignored God's warnings, yet even now there is grace for you today. The Lord's crying out to you today to return to him, to renew your commitment to him, to turn from your sins towards his amazing grace offered to you in his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it says here. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and, and rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, God doesn't want a religious show from you. He doesn't want you to tear your clothes. He wants you to tear open your hearts, to acknowledge your sin before him, to lay your heart bare before him, and throw yourself on his grace. You see, beloved, we do not respond to the, the warning signs that God graciously gives us in his word. We don't respond by cowering deeper and deeper into the darkness trying to hide. We respond by coming into the light of God's grace. And the reason why we can do that, the reason we're able to do that is, is that we know that when we step into the light, he will not reject us. When we come in repentance and faith, as the passage goes on to say in verse 13 of chapter 2, return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. This is the God who's calling out to you today. The merciful, gracious God abounding in steadfast love and he promises to forgive. He promises to restore us. That's the promise here. Out of verse 25, God promises on the other side of repentance, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. This is the promise for us today. The restoration of God. When you turn to him in repentance and faith, God will restore to you those years of your life you thought you wasted. The years you wasted performing and pretending. The years you ignored him and lived the life of a hypocrite. God will restore to you the joy of his salvation. And he will do that for our church family as well. He will restore to us the years we've wasted in disunity and division. He'll restore to us the years we've wasted in spiritual pride and hypocrisy. He'll restore to us the years we've wasted treating New Covenant like my church instead of his church. He'll restore to us vibrant worship and life-giving ministries again. Again. 
when we return to Him with all our hearts and rend our hearts before Him, God promises to restore. And how does this restoration come? Not by our, our own reason or strength. It doesn't come by trying harder and doing better. It doesn't come by man-made strategies and programs. This restoration comes by God's grace through God's Spirit. That's what it says in verse 28. Verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. You see, beloved, we can rush full speed ahead towards disaster and destruction in the power of our own strength, ignoring God's gracious warnings to us in his word, or we can turn back to the path of life and restoration graciously given to us by God through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. That's what's promised to us on the other side of repentance this glorious restoration of his grace, the empowering of his Holy Spirit, and the abundant salvation given to us in his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, this is why Christ came. That's what we see as we come to close. This is why Christ came, to purchase this promise of salvation for his people. As Paul writes in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've heard nothing else, we need to hear this. All we deserve in our sin is death. That's the wages that God owes you in your sin. All we deserve in our sin is death. All we deserve is for God to leave us on this path of disaster and destruction. That's what we deserve. But he's given us a free gift of his grace. Jesus Christ, his only son, who lived the life required of us, who died the death that we deserve, who experienced the disaster and destruction that we deserve on the cross so that when we turn to him, when we rend our hearts before him, we don't get what we deserve. We receive eternal life as a gift through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is why this passage can say with such certainty to the stiff-necked people of Israel and to a stiff-necked people like us, yet even now, no matter how many times you've turned aside and ignored the warnings of Almighty God because of Jesus Christ and what he's done in the words of Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the promise for us today. When we hear the warning of Almighty God and turn to him with all our hearts. Let's go before him now and call upon his name in prayer. Let us rend our hearts before him in confession and repentance. We'll have a season of prayer together as a church family where I'll lead us in a prayer of confession through God's law. And interspersed, there'll be moments of silent prayer and confession. And I'd encourage you to use that time to open your hearts to the Lord in confession and repentance, bringing your specific sins before him, crying out for his mercy and grace. And if you've been convicted this morning and, and you've come to sense your sin, I would encourage you to talk to somebody about it. If you've come to sense your hypocrisy and maybe that you don't know the Lord, talk to somebody about it. Ask for help. We'd love to talk with you. But let's come now before God in prayer and at the end we will have a responsive reading from Psalm 51. Join me now in prayer.